Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the Coast Guard gets ready for a four-star first in leadership. Marine amphibious assault vehicles return to the water after a deadly accident. And new developments in the wake of a West Point cheating scandal. Plus, we talk with a veteran behind a new film honoring the heroics of two Marines. All the latest from the annual C4ISRNet conference, where military and industry leaders map out strategies for future conflicts. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. We start this week with news from around the military, beginning in the Coast Guard. President Joe Biden has nominated the first woman to lead the service in a four-star command, continuing a string of groundbreaking appointments. Vice Admiral Linda Fagan received the nomination last week and currently serves as the head of the Coast Guard's Pacific Area of Operations. And over in the Corps, Marines are training in amphibious assault vehicles for the first time since a deadly accident in the summer of 2020. The Marine Corps suspended the AAVs from water training following the sinking of one of the crafts off the coast of California, which killed eight Marines and one sailor. Exercises have resumed in the AAVs, but moving troops from the ship to the shore or back again is still prohibited. And the fallout from an academic cheating scandal at West Point continues. Dozens of the 73 cadets accused of cheating on a freshman calculus exam will now have to repeat a year at the academy. Eight were kicked out in the wake of the scandal. It's one of the largest academic scandals at the academy since the 1970s. And finally, a Marine veteran turned filmmaker who took his movie on the festival circuit details the heroism of two Marines on April 22nd, 2008. I spoke with Joshua DeFore about the story from Iraq. Two years ago, when I was commander of all U.S. and Iraqi forces, in fact, on the 22nd of April, 2008, two infantry battalions, one nine, the Walking Dead, two eight, were switching out of Ramadi. One of the battalions was in its final days of its deployment. The other was just beginning its seven month combat tour. Lance Corporal Jordan Harder, 20, and Corporal Jonathan Yale, 22, were to assume watch together at the entrance gate of the Joint Security Station, Nasser. One of the Iraqis elaborated. He said, sir, in the name of God, no man, no sane man would have stood there and done what they did. They saved us all. I'm here with Joshua DeFore, the writer, director, and editor of The Eleventh Order, a short narrative film about two Marines who were killed in Iraq, but ultimately were honored for their bravery. Uh, so Joshua, tell me about the name of this movie and how that name set the path for everything that was to come. Yeah, that's uh, that was a huge crucial moment because the script up to that point we had, uh, the film was called like The Gates of Valhalla, I think. It had this really epic sounding title that wasn't specific enough, I feel like, to the story. But we didn't want to glorify the violence itself. So it was really, okay, what is thematically, what it, what is that, that through line here? And it was the 11th General Order, which really revolves around the entire idea of, of standing watch, standing gate, standing post, and not letting anyone come through. And this idea that they stood there and did their, did their duty until the very end, um, I feel like that's as, um, as far as following the 11th general order, I feel like that's as, as perfect as you could do that, unfortunately. So now 13 years later, what is the heart of this film that you want to share? What I would take from the film is, um, you know, you don't have to be a superhero to do what's right um, for your family or for your communities. Um, 
but having the courage to make those decisions, whether it's as large as standing at a gate or it's as small as just doing the right thing every day, um, I think that's that's pretty powerful. I think it's a film about two young men that are, you know, just trying to live their lives and ended up having to be put in extraordinary circumstance. Um, so I feel like that, like I said, I think that that can um, bring people together at a time when um, I think we're focused on, on division a little too much. And that's it from this side of the house this week. When we come back, the latest from military and industry leaders from the annual C4ISRNet conference. Stay tuned. The military and defense market is constantly evolving. Stay on top of the latest news with Sightline Media Group's live events. Continue to learn, understand new tools and technologies. We're live, you're on in three. Defense, two, government, one. and industry leaders come together for successful and proven engaging events. You'll gain valuable insight, get the chance to ask questions, all from the comfort of your own home or office. Sign up for our events newsletters and receive alerts for upcoming live streams. Joint All Domain Command and Control, better known as JADC2, is a new joint architecture for battlefield command and control. The new concept seeks to connect sensors across the joint force to those on the ground and those in command. The joint staff at the Pentagon has even created a cross functional team to guide the military's effort. And in last week's C4 ISR Net conference, broadcast virtually from Arlington, Virginia, we spoke to Lieutenant General Dennis Krall, Chief Information Officer at the Joint Chiefs, about that concept. This is about you know learning by doing. Uh, so we can write a lot, and you know the documentation is necessary to have a durable, repeatable, you know provable way uh, to to do this in an orderly fashion and make sure you're satisfied with the results. But there's also a part of us that we want to start now uh, and experiment uh, to inform those products. So really, what uh, I think is a pretty good accomplishment, in addition to uh, getting a JADC2 strategy written, briefed. Uh, uh, briefed even to the Hill uh, with the PSMs, the professional staff members, uh, and driving some of these mission threads. It's starting that work on demonstrations and mission threads that has me most excited. So we picked a few. Uh, you know, we've had about 80 submissions. We've whittled that down to uh, really two viable uh, categories and about 14 test cases. We're going to burn these fires bright. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. And the other is really making, uh, making us a data-centric organization, uh, identifying the policies that need to change in the department to make sure that we can share, you know, access, store, and you know, uh, settle the ownership matters around data. So those are some pretty heavy lifts that we've made great progress on already. First, you start with the condition, uh, and that is that we, we live with a set of ac you know, acquisition rules as far as pace goes that probably fit the Cold War era very well. Uh, when you look at the threat at that time, moving at three, five, 10 year pace was, was acceptable. And most of the equipment that was procured during that time lend itself to long lead and long build times. Physical things you can touch and see and, and the like. In the digital age, that uh, mechanism doesn't work well. Putting us on a five year POM cycle for funding, for example, makes it really challenging to identify a set of capabilities or requirements lay out a five-year plan of spending, and we end up getting yesterday's technology de you know, delivered tomorrow. Uh, by the time those funding streams come through and you execute those contracts, in many cases, the technology has already been surpassed. Uh, so I know that, uh, again, Congress has reached out to us and has discussed options that they're looking at. Uh, in the crudest sense, I would probably say something akin to an investment capital fund, which the DOD doesn't have, you know, money that could be earmarked, you know, multi-use uh, money. So it's not too specific, but allows that to be spent quickly. We could probably move faster to retire legacy, onboard, you know, some modern things uh, to get after it as well. So uh, I think that there might be some appetite uh, in to explore uh, things along those lines. There's a few questions here on the JADC2 strategy. Uh, the first question is, uh, will there be an unclassified version? Uh, yes, uh, there will be. There already is. We just don't have it approved yet uh, okay. for release. So we've, uh, we've created two. 
uh, what you'll find in the unclassed version, it'll be pretty satisfying to most. The areas that you might suspect that we have kept classified are surrounding the nuclear command and control apparatus. Uh, it's not classified that we have a line of effort uh, that involves NC3. Uh, what is classified, of course, are the details uh, surrounding that particular line of effort. The other lines of effort uh, that we have listed uh, are pretty open, and I think you'll, uh, the readers will be able to get the full sense of the direction JADC2 is heading and maybe some of the delivery milestones that we're looking to achieve. Yeah, the, the follow-up question uh, builds on that. Uh, the JADC2 strategy, to clarify, the JADC2 strategy has been approved by General Milley and is now being briefed to Dep Deputy Secretary Kathleen Hicks. Is that the current status? So it's been briefed, obviously, both to the chairman and to the deputy, and we're making some final revisions uh, on that draft. And it should move uh, quickly from uh, General Milley through the deputy, since both have already you know, established their uh, support for it, and then on to the secretary. So once we get our edits done and get that, uh, get that corrected, I'm hoping in days, uh, we should be able to move that forward. If different US services and allies will be fighting with the latest tech, they've gotta be able to communicate with each other, and that's not easy. In the recent CFRIS Internet conference, reporter Andrew Everston spoke to chief data officers of the US Army and the US Air Force about making those connections. There's also been some Army Air Force staff talks uh, recently, and one of the things that you've agreed on is to try and work together to develop common data standards. Uh, what progress have the two of you made on that effort so far? It's really about, really about operationalizing standards that actually exist. So to be able to push and pull data across making things interoperable. So I go back to that DOD data strategy, uh, Vault IS, the I is for interoperable and secure. And I think that's really where we've really worked with our uh, sister services to really make sure that we can share and share easily and using open standards where and when practical um, and really taking the work that's been done to date and pivoting from what I would call notional to actual operational. And I think that's what's really exciting about the work that we're doing is it's, we're really trying to drive that change quickly. And if take the established concepts and operationalize them. Dave, what are you thinking? I'll go back to the project convergence. We were really excited by the cooperation we've had from the Air Force and just super excited to get like F-35 in some of our uh, exercises and the ability to exchange both targeting data, uh, the ability to call uh, air support in faster times than ever we've seen before, the ability to help with the collection side of that type of seamless integration. I'll be honest, the project convergence was an experimental environment. It's not really up to the stress of an operational one. So have we identified fully the exact data in a, um, a more militarily robust situation? That's something we're still working on. Uh, so we haven't come to that point yet. Uh, but we're excited by the progress to date. Um, we, as General Carl said, thinking from the edge back, understanding network throughput and its ability to handle the data and coming up kind of with the right data scheme with the message traffic for very limited throughput at the edge is something where I think we're really kind of thinking through and will some of our legacy um, methods survive. I, I know the previous speaker mentioned about the transition from legacy to future and holding on the legacy. I gotta say, we're a big army, right? Um, we can't modernize everything at once so we have to have a transition plan that keeps us interoperable along that way. And where you start to get command and control and message traffic becomes, how do we start to identify where do we want the battlefield to be modernized to handle maybe this new data standard that's emerging with our work for the Air Force? And versus where do we want to keep it a bit legacy where we can keep it legacy? So because we, we can't modernize everything at once. So thinking through that in uh, space and time is uh, certainly one of our challenge areas we're, we're thinking through, but we're very excited by the progress to date with the Air Force. We, this cooperation has been fantastic. Make sure to stick around. We've got more of the conference later in the show. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips. 
From building your small business fleet and improving cash flow to renovating office space and purchasing IT equipment, as business owners come to find out quickly, you need access to capital to grow your company. So it's good that you actually do have options. If you're in the right space and time in your business, a business loan is a great place to start. It works like any other loan. You receive a lump sum of funding up front and pay it back in monthly installments over your designated period of time. Most banks or credit unions offer business loans, and the best place to start is the one where you've been doing your personal banking for years, the one you trust and the one that knows you. Before you apply, either dig up or create your business plan. You'll need that for any lender to consider lending to you for your business. You'll also need to provide a form of collateral or income to back up your reason for getting the loan. Another way to get access to capital is to get a business credit card. It's very similar to your personal credit card. You're given borrowing access to funds up to a certain limit for your business expenses. A lot of business owners make the most of a combo approach of business card and business loan, using the credit card for smaller day-to-day -day costs and the business loan to fund larger projects. Deciding what's best for your business depends on the type of business you own. And when it comes to growing your business, it should be a partnership between you and your lender. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more military and defense news, check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And if you want to be the most up-to-date in your unit, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, more from the C4ISRNet conference. It wouldn't be much of a C4ISRNet conference without Space Talk, specifically buying in this case, something services each had to do before Space Force. In this segment, reporter Nathan Strout spoke to General David Thompson, the Space Force's Vice Chief of Space Operations, and asked him if acquisition is getting easier with a new service. You know, one of the arguments for the creation of the Space Force was that it would help unify space acquisitions under one organization, right? Uh, do you think Space Force has largely done that with the establishment of Space Systems Command? Or is that something that needs to come still? Or is that less a priority under the Space Force at this point in time? Uh, uh, it absolutely remains a priority. Um, in fact, probably, as you said, still one of the top uh, priorities in, uh, for the Space Force and for the nation. This is the latest step, and in by no means are we close to done. There's still much more work to do. Uh, a couple of additional things, as, as you and I think probably most of the audience members know, we are still working on elements of an alternative acquisition process that uh, Congress has requested of us. We've been working it now for a couple of years with uh, the Department of Defense, with OMBN, with members of Congress. Um, the reorganization and the, the new structure for Space Systems Command helps that, but there's more work to do. Some of those elements of the, the approach that we're proposing, uh, we've already implemented. We've uh, pushed responsibility down to program managers. We've implemented a, uh, um, uh, we've provided them a head of contracting and contracting authority down to that level to be able to speed that. Um, but there's more work to do. The Space Development Agency is working on the National Defense Space Architecture, a network of mostly low orbit satellites to help the DOD move data through space. The agency's director spoke at the conference about how the network benefits you, the warfighter. We are joined today by Derek Tournier, director of the Space Development Agency. Uh, established in 2019, the SDA has been charged with creating the National Defense Space Architecture a proliferated space architecture that will eventually be made up of hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, those satellites will pass data back and forth to each other through a mesh network enabled by optical intersatellite links. Uh, to start off, to so start us off, Dr. Tournier, could you explain uh, what the transport layer is and how this on-orbit mesh network will benefit the warfighter? Certainly, certainly. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so the, uh, the, the mesh network and the, the transport layer, the whole idea is to be able to move data as rapidly as possible to get the, that tactical information directly to the warfighter. So what the transport layer consists of are hundreds of satellites that form a resilient, optically interconnected mesh network that will pass data directly to existing tactical data lakes. So what that means to the warfighter is the following. I can now move data from a targeting cell that could be located CONUS, or ideally that targeting cell will actually form a target on board on the satellites, and I can send that data down directly to an existing tactical data link 
on a weapons platform or on a weapon itself. So if you actually look at what the department is trying to do with the CJAD C2, the whole idea behind that is so that we have a way that we can close kill chains rapidly by being able to, to move data from sensors to target acquisition and, and formation and then to the weapon system. The transport layer is the way that that is done in space. The transport layer will tie all the CJAD C2 networks for all the services together so that we can have this unified means to be able to provide information so we can do beyond line of sight targeting directly to a weapons platform, putting it directly in hands of the warfighter. So we have a, an optical communication standard community of interest where we have people from, from industry and across the government that are involved to help us come up with that optical standard. Space Force had representatives as part of that community of interest. So we were, we were feeding data back and forth. And so their, you know, their inputs helped shape that, that standard. Uh, now they, they do have some, some, uh, some satellites that obviously anything that is, that is legacy or anything that is currently in build uh, will not be able to, to talk to, to our satellites via that optical crosslink just because it would be too large of an impact to put that onto their satellites now. However, uh, the plan would be going forward that uh, all military satellites would have a means to communicate directly with the, the transport layer as a way to move data around and then get data back and forth, uh, not only to the ground, but then inter-satellite type uh, uh, communication. So we're working with the Space Force on their future programs to make sure that they have compatibility so that they can plug into the transport layer. I want to talk a little bit more about that commercial aspect. Uh, so you're thinking that uh, but in the 2024 timeframe when Tranche 1 goes up, there will be some commercial satellites that can tie into the network. Uh, how many partners are you working with uh, to tie into the mesh network and what capabilities are they bringing in? That's absolutely the goal. Absolutely. In 2024, that timeframe, uh, so, the, so keep in mind, the Tranche 1 satellites will, will launch in, in 2024, and then they'll, they'll fly with a lifetime of, of notionally five years, right? So any, anything sure. that launches in that time frame is where we're talking with commercial entities to be able to plug in. And so we're talking with, right now we have, we have three commercial mission partners that we've been in discussions with, three or actually between, three or four, depending on how you, how you count it. We've had discussions with more, but those... Three or four, we've had some pretty serious discussions where we've exchanged some, some technical information. And as far as the data, what, what are we looking at? So we're talking with, uh, as I mentioned, our custody layer. Custody is our ISR layer. Uh, SDA is not building out any of those satellites. We're working with mission partners to actually build out those satellites and then put those data on the transport layer. And that would be your, that would essentially feed your, your targeting data. So we're talking with commercial partners that provide commercial electro-optical information, uh, commercial SAR information, uh, commercial SIGINT information on how we could get those data into the transport layer direct communication with, with, uh, with optical crosslinks. Then we're also talking with commercial partners that provide, in essence, a uh, high bandwidth data backhaul to say, now how could we use the transport layer is specifically designed for the Department of Defense to make sure that we have positive command and control for our tactical targeting, you know, for wartime scenario. But how could we actually tie into other companies that are building out these mesh networks in space to have an alternative or a backup to make us more resilient as a means to be able to pass data off of the transport layer? So we've been talking with those, those kind of companies as well. There was a lot of good conversations in that conference. C4 ISRNet has regular conversations with the brightest minds in military innovation. The next installment of the Removing Stovepipe series is on Thursday and will explore the future of the Army's position, navigation, and timing systems. You can keep track of these live events on C4ISRNet.com slash newsletters. And that's it from Defense News Weekly for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us and stay healthy out there. <laughs>